Nice to meet you, Jeff. Thanks a lot yeah. for coming on. Yeah, Daniel and I have been working on this podcast for maybe like six years now, and wow. um, we've had some Stanford professors and um, s- some of our heroes on our on our podcast, and, and we're grateful for you coming on. We we love uh, technology and entrepreneurs. Um, Daniel also did the Y Combinator program, and yeah, so had that in common. Um, uh, for me, I, I studied at Stanford for a, a bachelor's, master's, and PhD, and I'm an entrepreneur as well. And so I just love to get into the details, like how how you make, got this off the ground, and it, it's like such a fascinating idea. I, I, I went to Singularity University, and um, oh. one of the pro- projects at that time was 3D printing houses. And so uh, you just got an awesome concept, and uh, such such an important uh, resource if, if if you can get it really off the ground. Um, so I'm fascinated to hear your story. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, cool. That helps some. Yeah, that helps a lot. I think there's going to be a lot of things we can go into. We've got what, 55 minutes or so. Yep. And I'm, I pretty much just been spending the day talking shit, so to speak. (laughs) So I can go over a bit as well if we need to. Awesome. Yeah. So why don't we kick it off? Like, I think the question I asked before was like, how do you even go down this path? Like what led you to this point in your life where you're the CEO of this company, I guess we could backtrack quite a bit. I'm curious, like, you know, taking the steps to get to that point, like what was that journey? Yeah. You know what? It wasn't a linear thing. (laughs) It was actually a bit of a dumpster fire, literally. And I can uh, take you through what I mean when I say that. Let me see if I can share, share screen. Is that it was, it was actually quite uh, literally a dumpster fire. Going back to my uh, days as an environmental science professor. So I uh, actually went out, got a PhD in environmental science and became a professor. You know, I was writing papers. I think the last paper that I wrote was something to the effect of the intra-urban, yeah, intra-urban concentrations of particulate matter less than 10 microns in diameter and the adverse effects on epidemiological cohort studies. Don't know what that means, but... (laughs) I don't either, of which no one would ever, ever read. I still can't uh, share screen for some reason. I'm not sure. It must be a Zoom if thing. You, Greg, maybe you can try to give him uh, screen sharing. See if yeah. Um, there you go. Now you can do oh, it. Oh, cool. Okay. Awesome. So uh, this really adds a lot to the story. I wanted to share my screen because you know, after being bored for a while, uh, I went to the university and I said, hey, you know what? I would like to live in a dumpster for a year. I want to sell off everything I own, all my possessions. I actually put up a post on social media and said, hey, all my classes, come by my house, selling everything out of my house for a dollar an item, right? And I'm going to get rid of it because I just want to trim down to the absolute like essentials. And I want to see what it's like to live in a very small space. It also happens to double as a uh, symbol of waste. So I convinced the university to let me set up this dumpster, 33 square feet, uh, behind the dorms on the back of campus. This is in Austin. And uh, I went through the process of transforming this thing from a used dumpster, my girlfriend actually claimed she could still smell barbecue in there, into a home. So you can see I started learning a lot about small spaces here. I played this uh, character called Professor Dumpster that was like, I don't know, a love child of Bill Nye and Oscar the Grouch. Then tricked out the dumpster, ended up putting air conditioning on it, a rotating uh, opening ceiling. And that's what it looked like by the end. And so this really was the beginning of my founder's journey. I learned a lot about housing, zoning, coding, a zone coding, you know, what it took to build a livable space, living on less. And I went from there and I founded Quit University and uh, founded a micro housing startup, the predecessor to Juke. Wow. So you lived in that a year? I lived in this for a year. Yeah. You know, by the end of it, owned a whole lot less stuff. And I've kind of stuck to that to this point. I could probably fit all of my possessions today still into a dumpster. You know, I, I there, there were definitely some lessons around dog fooding there as well uh, that I sort of took all the way through to today. So 
I can continue the story, you know, moved out of the dumpster. Uh, one of my friends said, hey, this idea for this modular housing concept you have is pretty interesting. You should go raise some money. Uh, I should make a pitch deck. And I said, what, sh- what the hell is a pitch deck? <laughs> and he said, it's cool. You just make like a PowerPoint and you ask people for money and uh, they give you money and sometimes, and then you go and build what you're talking about building. So the idea here was to kind of make the iPhone of housing, right? So I got some industrial designers. We built a whole operating system for these things. And the idea was to mass manufacture housing to try to solve some problems around the housing crisis. And the sort of you know, particular angle on this was that we would find really small pieces in the urban space. And uh, there are all these little triangles and weird slices of land within uh, urban areas and then build these micro units and stack them up, right? Such that we could, uh, we could take special advantage of that space. So, built this out. This is one being lowered in a backyard. So today we know these as ADUs. This was really early in this game, about 2015, probably a little bit early. They were really beautiful, small little micro units. Ultimately, it was not a venture scalable business. (laughs) Essentially had a soft landing at the end of this thing and sold it off uh, to some folks that wanted to sort of take it in a hospitality angle. So uh, that was the journey kind of leading up to Jupe. I guess as a failed startup founder, I did what many of us do, convinced myself I would never have another idea, moved out to the West Texas desert and bought a bar, lived uh, with some of my neighbors uh, in the bar and in my uh, trailer uh, on the edge of the desert with a little heart on it. And uh, pretty much thought that was going to be how I was going to live out my the rest of my days. But now, look, I'm with you guys on a podcast. I guess I've 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 made it, or maybe I'm still in the trailer. Who knows? <laughs> oh, so I guess your 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 iPhone the, the thing was very you know that was like a, a full on ADU. There's a lot of regulations around those things, so you probably were fighting government and them not understanding concept. Maybe I don't I don't know. I've never been in that this space of building ADUs like us. Yeah, no it, ADU regulatory space or something in California called Senate Bill 1069 that really opened up the this space, and you've seen a lot of startups come along. Uh, in the last few years, sort of since Casita, that allow you to get a state level permit on one of these ADUs, one of these accessory dwelling units, backyard units, such that you can drop it into a backyard in most municipalities, right? And there are some other companies out there doing this, uh, namely uh, Abodu, it's probably had the most traction. Um, They were also funded by Initialized Capital and Gary Tan. These guys are able to really sort of scale that up, but there's still a lot of problems around the scalability of the actual box. And you're still pouring foundations. You are uh, still hooking up uh, grid connections. You're still dealing with unruly neighbors, right? There are a lot of things that still kind of have to happen for these things to drop, but it is much faster than it used to be. And it's really expensive because it's a, a, a lot of gear and equipment and walls and ceiling. That's right. You know, it's it's a so like so you built an ADU company and you were trying to scale it. Like what was one of the lower points like in that process? Because it's it's, be- it's beautiful. Was it that like people were just not buying them? Was it like the price? Yeah, I mean, there were frankly just so many problems, right? Like if you're going to start a hardware company, maybe try like starting with something, I, I don't know, like the size of uh, this, right? <laughs> like, or yeah. I don't know, maybe a little riskier, like starting with like, a I don't know, a motorcycle, maybe a little riskier, a car, you know, don't uh, start yeah. with the slowest yeah. Most regulated industry with a 30,000 pound piece of hardware that needs to go, you know, into somebody's backyard with a business model that also is not a recurring business model, right? It's a selling a widget once at a margin and you're kind of done. And so all of the lessons that I took from Casita, we try to apply directly into my new company, 
uh, juke, you know, all those pain points. But I don't even know where to start, man. Like it was yeah. very, very painful. There's a reason why, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this industry hasn't changed and why we have a housing crisis. I felt a lot of those sort of problems firsthand in my first startup. Got it. You were also a minimalist. So like just backtracking a little more, like even to when you were in the dumpster, how do you get rid of things that you love? Like when you're becoming a minimalist, like um, maybe there's like a tricycle that you were like a, a kid and you save the tricycle and you don't even use it. Like you kind of have to let those things go. A lot of people can't like you, I, I'll, I'll be driving and I see people's garages and it's like their whole life has been collected into a garage. <laughs> Like, what do you do to become a minimalist to like live in something the size of a jupe or an ADU or like a dumpster? How do you do that? And like, what's the mindset? Yeah, I mean, there are all these books out there, there are entire films like on sort of the, the how to of this. You know, for me, I knew it was going to be a forcing function if I only had, uh, I think it was eight cubic yards. <laughs> a volume right in in the dumpster right so i you know what i said was like okay you can only fit so many couches so many sweaters so many jumpsuits right uh so many pairs of shoes so many coffee books in in a volume that large right so I sort of, in some ways, forced my way in there, said I'm not going to hold on to anything that doesn't actually go into this dumpster. And there's some exercises that some of these folks out there have like this around, you know, how, how much stuff do you really need? And even if it is out of sight, is it really out of mind? And so I've seen folks go through these exercises where like they'll box up everything they own and kind of put it in one room. And then as they actually need another, call it fork or another plate or another food or that one shirt, right? They begin to pull stuff out. And then over a certain map, you know, amount of time, call it a month, a quarter, a year, they'll just kind of then in the end realize they didn't need or even think about any of that other stuff that was that that was in that one specific space. But to me, it's kind of become just a, a pretty utilitarian sort of thing um, to where saves me a lot of time and money and share of mind. I mean, I essentially wear the exact same thing uh, every day. And I know a lot of people out here uh, do in the Valley, at least. Yeah. I, I went through something really similar where I, uh, when I, when I, when I was invited to Y Combinator in winter 2011, I lived in New York and I, I had to get on a plane. Yeah. I literally abandoned my apartment, <laughs> got on the plane, just left it, just came, kept paying the rent and like, <laughs> this stuff became meaningless. It kind of like, as it's like, it's funny how like spatial when things are in your preview or not in your preview, it kind of changes your perspective. You know, I just had a backpack of like shirts, pants, like sneakers, laptop. That was it. And I kind of just, everything else faded away in my life. I'm like, man, that stuff is really not that important. And I, I built my own system for simplicity, but anyway, just kind of going on. Greg, you had a question it looked like? Yeah, I saw that your uh, group partner was Michael Siebel. Uh, he he spoke at um, at Draper University when I was there. Um, could could you tell us about some of the things that you learned from him? You know, Michael, uh, we we called him Antonio and I called him uh, sort of the Yoda startups. Michael has an incredible ability to take troves and troves of data and information and sort of just peel it down to its absolutely essential, like one phrase. He also is highly adept at no bullshit <laughs> and telling founders, maybe not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. So much so that I made a Michael Seibel motivational quotes that I've got here on Notion. I'll just read you a few of these from the inside of all of you YC companies. We forgot why we invested in you. <laughs> just very real. You are all dead companies walking. We wanted to make motivational mugs of these. I've seen some of your investor reply emails. They are absolute dog shit. He says, he says these things with a very loving kind of, uh, you know, I'm sure loving approach to it. But I mean, the guy is 
absolutely brilliant and I would say has more data on looking at early stage, like with, with a little bit of data, he's able to, I think, make predictions into the future about folks that like, it's, it's pretty uncanny. The other thing is that like the guy would remember, you know, we would have office hours, the most minute details with no notes, right? Um, from conversations we had been having with him about our startup and was and, and was helpful every time we would talk to him. So it was kind of crazy. He's a really remarkable guy. How does that make you feel that quote about uh, what was it? Most of the startups are walk. What was that quote? It was most all of, the of you. You are all dead companies walking. Right. Scary quote. I mean, it's a very scary quote, but it's true. Right. In the very early stages, you know, you want to come in, especially as a first time founder, believing it's all going to be easy. We've already got product. I'm sure product market fit is right in front of us. Right. We'll forever have funding. Uh, investors will love us. Oh, my God. We made it into Y Combinator. We've already we made it to the promised land. Right. When in reality, we're all dead companies walking. None of us have traction. None of us have product market fit. You know, none of us uh, have to uh, default to live. We don't even know what a lot of these phrases even mean coming into this. So it's a real kind of wake up call for somebody you admire that much to say something like that to you and be serious about it and make you really check in that, oh, shit, guys, there's things we actually have to worry about here. Besides getting in tech crunch. <laughs> Did that change your perspective on your internal company? Like users, revenue, design, culture? Like what did it do to you? Because when someone says that to you, it's daunting. <laughs> it means something like, what did that do to your culture? Yeah, you and your I, I mean, I think it just makes things real. Okay, if we're a dead company walking... You know, I, I think that goes hand in hand, right, with being, you know, I guess it's Paul Graham's sort of famous essay said, right, you're de default alive or default dead. Well, we're all at that case default dead. So, you know, the I think I, I think the most successful founders, right, I saw something the other day uh, have a, a fairly skeptical short term outlook on things a fairly optimistic long view on things. And if you swap those two things around, or even if it is any other combination of that kind of two by two matrix, then it can cause some pretty significant problems. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, I, I say something interesting where um, it's hard for a company over a thousand years. The momentum is you, Jeff, and your co-founders. I like why yeah, yeah. Combinator like ingrained that into me? It's like you're the momentum. You guys are not working. If there's internal fighting, I, I see it already. Like you're determined. Like you did this for so many years, whether with or without YC, you would be doing <laughs> this in some form or fashion for yourself. Like, so I, I do think that that's probably why they invested. The chances of you being dead quickly are low because you've just been so passionate about this, this idea. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I would push back and say like the, the, the passion's great, but I was really passionate about Casita as well. And it died. Right. You know, I think what's great about Y Combinator is they give you that reality check uh, and then give you the tools to sort of make it right. Right. Give you the, the, the network and the tools and the community to set some of those things in the right direction. Yeah. 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 I uh, go for it, Craig. Oh, oh yeah. I, I saw you spent some time at Harvard um, and I was wondering uh, what motivated you to sort of shift gears from academia to startups. Was it the idea of having, having impact on real people's lives and yeah, was this particular yeah, problem? That, yeah. You nailed it. Right. Like I said earlier on, right. This sort of ridiculous paper that I was writing that, like no one knows what that means. And 
even the students that I would have to force to read it, which may be the only six or seven people in a seminar that would ever read that paper. <laughs> um, you know, the scalability of the impact on the world is just really hard to find in academia, right? You know, you can, I think you make a pretty fair argument of saying, hey, you're going to get ROI out of these individuals if you if you somehow empower them to go out and change the world. But a very direct acting on the world, which is you know what I was I think really missing out at uh, in, in in academia and the ability to scale impact. You really you know. Right now, for best or worse, capitalism is the best way, and a startup is the best way to enact that impact. And look, we want to, I have written on my laptop here the number 100 million. I mean, we want to make, we want to put 100 million people into some form of shelter or onto some form of shelter platform before we're done with this little experiment. And there's just no way you're going to directly affect a base Maslow need of 100 million people um, in most forms of academia. There may be a few that are able to do it, but I certainly wasn't smart enough. What, what kind of like micro experiments uh, have you run locally? I, I know there's a ton of homeless in San Francisco, of course. Uh, what, what kind of proof proof points have you achieved? Yeah, so we've built uh, to date about 120 of these jupes. One of the things I realized from my last startup where we were going directly at the affordable housing problem was that you can't make a Model 3 straight off. You just can't. Elon barely made a Model 3 after making the Roadster, right? And he had $100 million in his pocket and a pretty good track record. With these large problems, whether it be transport, energy, food, clothing, things like shelter, like we're working on, they've been big problems for a very long time. And if they were easy to solve directly, somebody would have done it. And so the approach we said, well, like, let's start digging around and find a market that's much more approachable and higher end and higher margins to get started with much like the Roadster market was for him. And for us, that's been a, a market called glamping, which is sort of glamorous camping, camping, getting deep into nature, right? And having a good night of sleep uh, in a very comfortable environment. And that's where we've started. That's our Tesla Roadster market. So we have not put these out here on the streets of San Francisco because frankly, if they were free and if they were, as nice as your home was at home, it wouldn't work. It can't work in the the way the current system works. At Orange Dow, you had some ambitious plans about possibly doing something in San Francisco. Absolutely. Maybe you could talk more about like what you're thinking. What would you envision San Francisco and how that would change? Are you in Are you in California still, or have you moved? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in the mission right now in SF. I'll tell you what my one experiment was. So you know, in the kind of spirit of dog fooding, uh, I'll see if I can find uh, my uh, photo here. Uh, I actually lived in a Jeep during Y Combinator in a parking lot in downtown San Francisco, this one, throughout the batch, right off Folsom and 12th. In Soma, for people that know San Francisco, this is not like a place you, you typically want to like volunteer to live in a parking lot. It was behind a fence. I was, you know, and had a lot of, I was new to San Francisco. A lot of folks said, hey, bro, like, are you okay down there? I was like, what do you mean am I okay? I'm behind a fence, you know, hadn't had any problems. Well, so from the beginning of the batch, I guess, which was like in June, all the way through to December, I lived in this parking lot in this jupe. I mean, it was serious dog fooding. But after having lived in a dumpster, right, not not that big of a deal. This was kind of a McMansion. So I go around way for December and I had just finished telling somebody how it was all good living in this in San Francisco. And uh, I get a text with a photo uh, let me see if I can find this of this. And uh, the guy said, hey, it seems like you've got a roommate. 
And so a homeless guy had actually moved into my jupe, this guy, my, my buddy, and uh, pretty much found the sweetest tent you could ever find on the streets of San Francisco, along with a, uh, you know, a bottle, my, my scale, an REI cook stove, some, uh, you know, candles for sort of, uh, my liquid death. He had pretty much uh, moved himself in, right? And then his then his boyfriend moved in as well. So, uh, wow. <laughs> you know, it was a very firsthand experience of this. You know, they're like, hey, we'll get these guys out of here, whatever. And I said, no, actually, I'm going to fly. I was home for uh, the holidays back in Texas. I said, I'm going to fly back out there. Leave those guys in there and don't touch it. I This is this is a user, you know, study here. Let's let's see how the guys like the place. So I got back. The guys had left, but I did manage. This is me in it. A few days later, it's January 4th cleaning it up. And then the things I found in there, right? Needles, swabs. Apparently these are used to like take out the particles uh, from like when you're shooting up my jupe bandana. I got to keep, keep it on brand. And then a picture of penguins from the San Francisco zoo. <laughs> I think the, the larger sort of point here, that's kind of interesting that at some point there's probably something to write about is like, Hey, in some ways, Y Combinator, the larger tech scene, myself, probably contributed to some of these problems in some way, not directly, but the cost of housing, the lack of supply, the jobs coming in, right? Like these are interrelated things, right? From me being a Y Combinator founder and thinking I'm just going to hang out down in the middle of this and the folks moving in. So it brought it into very sharp focus that this is still a problem and this is a big problem we need to work on, but it's a very complicated problem, just like housing. So that was what my one experiment, Greg, so far of user testing in San Francisco. We, we have a lot of work to do. Did, did you think about finding maybe like a safer neighborhood, for example, like Mountain View, uh, right <laughs> off Castro Street? Like, I mean, are, are you legally legally able to just like put your your dumpster right there in the parking lot, or how 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 can oh, you the, choose the like, the, the, the like, jute? How, like, how'd you get your permission to to dump the uh, um, the jute jute right there? Yeah, I was able to put it there because frankly, I knew the guy that owned the parking lot. So it wasn't a random parking lot that I set up in. And I, I said, hey, I'm going to be needing to pitch investors. I'd like to do demo day from my front porch. Could I set this jupe up in your parking lot? You know, speaking of the the legal aspect of it, I mean, we can get into this more, but we we tried to design jupe such that it was able, it didn't really fit into the, any of the regulatory guidelines. So I like to say it was a little less illegal than Airbnb or Uber when they first started up. There just aren't a lot of regulations around something under 200 square feet that doesn't have a foundation, that doesn't plug into the grid, that's a soft top, that's not on wheels, that includes its own foundation, that doesn't have a bathroom internally. Like all those things, actually, it's it's been designed to not fit into a box, so to speak. It does look aesthetically pleasing. So it almost looks like it's part of the environment. A car kind of could be unpleasing to the eye. The jupe is very... So it's sitting in that parking lot almost feels like it's part of what was supposed to be there. Yeah, it's it's really weird how this thing has been designed. So the guy, um, the designer of like the Cybertruck ATV and a guy that worked on a lot of different things at Tesla and formerly at Frog designed these. And we really wanted something that looked more like a spaceship than looked like a tent or a yurt. And what's interesting, that shape, it fits in in this urban space. It's like so out of place that it's in place, but it also fits in right in like the deep uh, sort of woods. This is up in uh, Canada, actually, at one of our sites. Um, so uh, it, it tends to kind of work that it's so out of place. It sort of feels in place in all these different kind of spaces. I noticed, I noticed it's pretty open. Like, are you able to put curtains like in case like mosquitoes start getting in there? Or? 
Yeah, it's actually got a screen all the way around. So um, there's screens on the side and then you can actually drop a screen in the front as well. I want you to ask your question, but um, I, I want to know also how you're targeting the glamping environment. Like, are we talking like locally here in, in California? Like, I don't know, Tahoe or something? Or, um, I'm curious about that, but also being on, I want to hear your question. I'll hold off on my question first. Yeah, so we are, uh, we've built out an entire software platform. Uh, you know, they teach you to build stuff fast at Y Combinator. We got a couple of XYC founders that had already built out an entire, almost like kind of mini Airbnb for roommates. And so we were able to write, and I can, uh, I can show this as well for the folks that are on video. Uh, we we're able to write out an entire, build an entire platform that allow you to book these jupes direct. So we've got all our different sites here. Here's one nearby down in Davenport. Um, and so you can see the jupes. You can actually go in and book them individually or the entire site. And then we've got a back end like property management platform as well for the hosts. So this is almost like a mini Airbnb of glamping. Are, are you are you cross-listing the posts like on Airbnb? It's like a distribution channel. Yep. So we have it built. The software is built such that if somebody books directly on our back, but um, on our platform, it blocks out Airbnb and vice versa. So we can use them for distribution right now, but, uh, you know, eventually we'll be, uh, you know, pushing most of the folks through our own platform. Um, and wh why this is interesting as well is, there's never been a company before, right? You, you usually are either kind of building the physical space, right? Call it like one of these ADU makers or you're building the platform, right? To get people there, the Airbnb. And Jupe for the first time is building both and integrating the experience across them, right? So that's what makes, I think, what we're building really interesting because from the moment you hear about Jupe or want to go glamping through to booking, then arriving on site and moving out of the metaverse into sort of the world of atoms, we can now facilitate that entire experience, your night of sleep, everything around there, back to the metaverse, right? When you might get pushed, uh, say, a notification that a new site has opened up, um, up in Sonoma, right? Or up in Tahoe. I noticed some pricing there. It looked like maybe about $100 a night. And I saw also pricing that the Jupe costs 15000 Does that mean it's sort of profitable for you after 150 bookings? What does it look like to get yeah, to- Yeah, that's um, right. I'm not sure the, the 15000 that you saw, that's probably closer around to our cost than the retail price. But yeah, so- what we do is we um, are able to go to a landowner. So our business model is we don't buy this land and we don't actually operate the jupes. We only make the you know physical space and deliver it and then all the software that controls the experience to finding it and getting it. So what this allows us to do is scale really quickly because we're not and it, it's a different type of capital, right? Going out and buying real estate and it's very slow. So if somebody's got a nice piece of land and they want to immediately monetize that, if it's a raw piece of land, we come in, drop the jupes, drop our, our, our bathrooms, or they can build bathrooms if they want and uh, throw it on the platform and they're instantly earning revenue, right? Or if you've got an Airbnb, say, outside of Tahoe that sleeps six people, we find that that market doesn't have many Airbnbs that sleep a lot of people. We can say, okay, next week we will drop five jupes there. And the very next night you can change your listing from sleeping six to sleeping 16. And then we'll split the upside of that additional revenue. And you know, now every bachelor party or wedding event that wants to book in Tahoe there's one more piece of inventory there now that wasn't there the day before. What's the pricing model? Like, do you, um, do you let them just have the jupe and then they kind of pay it off over time as they get bookings or do they have to pay a big uh, chunk of money like up front? Yeah, it's generally negotiated on a kind of uh, um, site by site basis, depending on what they've already got there, you know, depending on what the sort of take rate is. Right, what how the percentage is is broken down between the two groups, 
Um, a lot of times on those Airbnb deals, it's kind of a lease to own kind of thing. So it'll be like $500 a month per jupe, right? And then over, call it like four or five years, that person will actually own the jupe. And then there's a rev share on top of that. So rather than having to pay the whole retail price of like $29,000 for the jupe and the porch and the bed, like all in, they're out $500. And actually our typical uh, nightly rates on those kind of sites, yeah, you know, we're we're getting closer to probably uh, 175, 200 a night for our like deep nature sites. The ones down at the Redwoods are going for 250 a night or 1500 for the site. I saw that awesome video from Gary Tan. So Gary Tan, one of the, well, now the president of Y Combinator, he stayed in a jupe in, in the Redwoods. I think it was the Red, I don't, I'm not quite sure, but it, it was really yeah, deep. Yeah, it was that same site. Yeah. Deep in nature. And it was, uh, you could sense even just from the video, like we're so plugged in all day. That video, I could just sense you calm. Gary was calm. It was a very like. Yeah, it's, there, there's something really calming about being in deep nature, but then getting into a warm blanket on an $800 mattress in this high design space with a Starlink white, like, can, like, there's something about that I think Jupe allows folks to do is just like inserting this sort of comfort into deep, deep parts of nature that you never would have been able to go. There's not even a cell signal in that valley, but because we've got the Starlink there, right, we can, you, you can actually connect. And what blew my mind is like, it's not just uh, the upper part. You and Gary in that video were really showing all the pieces on the floor and the way that you guys designed that whole entire floor is just so well thought out. Like it's a whole base. Yeah. So the idea is that, you know, we're more kind of a chassis. Um, we're modeled after actually Rivian was the inspiration for the physical product in their skateboard chassis. And the idea was that, you know, what if you could build a skateboard chassis for uh, infrastructure, right? So, you know, the idea that these jupes will flat pack on a truck, they can be dropped off, they can be popped up, right? They can be moved again. Well, now you have a fleet of these rooms that can be used for Coachella one day, wildfire relief the next, and then dropped for six months, say in Montana in the summer for glamping. So you have a highly mobile, flexible fleet, not only of the rooms, but that can be used for a bunch of other things based on sort of how we've built this chassis, right? We can drop batteries, we can drop air conditioners, we can make actually the entire base one big battery or water tank or whatnot. So here's a just a render of one of those same sort of chassis, right, with solar panels and a bunch of batteries in it, right, that could act as a battery pack. We can also build water tanks out of that same chassis, right? And hold 500 gallons of fresh gray or black water. What we're doing is packetizing infrastructure, right? So that we can eventually pop up a village anywhere on the face of the planet, very efficiently, live very comfortably while we're there, and then move it when we need to. That is the longer vision. And this comes into play with you know, what Balaji is talking about with the network state, you know, I, I think probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with, with this idea that, you know, what will evolve after what we're currently in the current political geopolitical arrangement, which is the nation state, the sort of network state will arise, right? Where, uh, it's no longer about kind of this one big piece of land and homogenous population voting and having diplomatic control, but these archipelagos of land all over the world where a online community, right, will assemble in these and own these. Well, there's no infrastructure yet for these archipelagos of land. Nobody's thought about how the hell is anybody going to go there? And so we're trying to sort of skate towards where that puck is heading in some sense um, with the very early things that we're doing from a software, IoT, infrastructure, like all of that stuff. 
And Starlink really enables it. Have you connected with the Airbnb founders? I know they were part of Y Combinator, like Brian Chesky. Uh, I think Dan Daniel might even know, know some of them. Uh, what, what kind of feedback have you gotten from them? I haven't connected with them. No, not yet. No, I'd love to. Yeah, there's definitely a synergy there where you're, you know, Airbnb, the whole concept was like rent what you got. You're kind of yeah. saying you got some land, <laughs> utilize it more effectively or yeah. wherever you're going. Yeah, so it's, it's like, kind of like we're full stacking, right? So we've got the software now to be able to do that. But it would almost be like if Airbnb had said, hey, we'll drag and drop a home onto your raw piece of land. Or in our case, we'll drag and drop an extra room onto your house that you can now rent, right? And if you want it to go away, we can snap our fingers and make it go away. So you don't have to worry about the mortgage and the right, the bank and what they're saying, all, all, all of these folks. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's really kind of the idea. There are 1.6 billion acres of unused land in the lower 48 alone. That's the TAM. It's not housing, right? Or disaster relief or... Balaji villages. I mean, that's the true like arbitrage there are the billions of acres on the planet that currently are can can cannot be built upon for various reasons. I actually drove across country um, this summer. There is so much land in the United States and it's it's just it's mind blowing. So beautiful. It's amazing how like the human race has like chosen certain places to really just habitat. And there's just so much more of the United States that just because there's no infrastructure there, we just kind of like let it sit. Yeah. You have like, a, like such an abound, like a bound opportunity to like pop up like a small village and say, Hey, here we go, guys. Here's a, uh, some land that's basically near some water. I don't know if you even need that, but it's like, yeah, I mean, eventually we shouldn't water. even, or, or just migrate. Right. Like you move these right. villages with the weather North and South. So you always have LA weather. Wow. <laughs> I think about this all the time now living here in the mission. I think the mission outside of probably Brooklyn or, you know, Manhattan is one of the most walkable, right, sort of areas of the country where you can get a lot of different foods, drinks, right, shops, this kind of stuff. But I think about what would I need to live in the middle of nowhere and still be pretty damn happy, right? I'd need a fast internet connection, a warm bed a good desk. I don't know. I wouldn't need it, but it'd be cool to like have a sauna. I'd need some of my friends probably around would be cool. Need to be able to get a, like a good latte or a good cup of coffee and a good bite to eat. And besides that, why do we then need the city? <laughs> you, you mentioned about some scalability blockages that you've, been, you've encountered. Could, could you tell us more about that? Like for example, manufacturing the parts like China and not delivering, or I'm, I'm not sure what your manufacturing process is. Yeah. So my co-founder uh, manufacturing, you know, is a beast <laughs> for those of you that have not tried it, not, not really recommended. <laughs> my and co-founder mean, mean like making something physically. actually just making a physical thing. Okay. It's just, you can't know what you don't know. My co-founder fortunately like built out more Sprinter vans than anyone in the world at one point. He built a GM factory that turned out an Escalade every 57 seconds. Like he really knows manufacturing. And so we've been able to be pretty smart with how we do that. We actually CNC all of our parts and then assemble them on the factory floor in about four hours per jupe right now, which we can get to be, you know, much, much faster. So we, we assemble slash manufacture all of our own stuff. Frankly, things like raspberry pies have been like the hardest things supply chain wise to get our hands on. Oh yeah. And then at one point we were using Russian birch, Baltic birch for our sort of floors and things. And that became a little bit of a problem. So we've moved to a North American uh, sort of variant of that. We don't have the supply chain issues, but a lot of it is just like, you know, moving atoms around is hard. It's expensive, especially in these sort of early stages in these startups, you know, keeping an eye on the capital and how you spend it, right? 
We've managed to get some financing now around working capital, makes things a hell of a lot easier. Such a fascinating story. I guess, what do you see like 10 years from now in terms of like your vision? Do you see a jupe on every, I guess, yeah, talk through that like vision, big yeah, vision. I think like- what I would like to, I think the vision I think should be from an individual's perspective. Folks should be able to go and live where they want for the amount of time they want, with whom they want, right? With the stuff that they want, frictionless, right? We should be able to remove the friction from that system. And I think Jupe is in as good a position as anybody to be able to do that just by the nature that we're building the full stack of all of the software, building the infrastructure, right? Stitching that together with technology. For example, you know, 10 years from now, I should be sitting here in San Francisco and say, you know what, I want to get with 10 of my friends for the North American winter. I want to go down to Argentina and live in a beautiful place. I should be able to not only be able to bring up on the Jupe map, because now I'm living on a subscription on the platform and I happen to be living, let's say, on a rooftop here in San Francisco right now with a jupe in a bathroom and a Zoom a, a Zoom jupe. Maybe there even isn't a site in Patagonia right now. I should be able to drop a pin and then drag my friends in that might want to go and send them an invite to a pristine place and then drag in the things I want at that site. And then if everyone agrees, you know, pays with, whatever currency and votes in whatever way they do at that point, then we should just all go. And the ticket should be booked and my Uber should be booked and there should be a box that arrives at my jupe that I throw all my shit in and it should go down there and it should just be frictionless. It's a really hard thing to do and get to, but I think there's a non-zero chance we can get there. (laughs) That's a really cool future. I don't know. I, I was just thinking like Greg travels a lot, you know, he traveled the world. I'm like, there are probably some places where you wanted to go, Greg, where you were restricted. Like, I can't go there because there's no hotels. I can't go there because it's inhabitable. <laughs> you know, he traveled like over the last couple of years. And for me, like I traveled across the United States. There were times when I was like trying to book a hotel room. There were no hotel rooms. Nothing. You know, they no. were all booked up. I wish there was like a jupe, <laughs> instantaneous jupe creation, like in this corner. Of this area, it could have been like a well, you, you should know. be able to like you should be able to order, yeah. you should be able to order it, right? You should be able to say, Hey, I'm going to this area of a city or the country, and it should be you should be able to almost summon it. That's a really difficult yeah. problem with a lot of vectors to solve. Right. I mean, Uber got there in some some amazing way. They got to that point where like you can summon a car with a person in it. It's insane. Like they got there. I, it's definitely, you know, 10 years from now, you'd be surprised if I could just have a jupe app and just be like, I need one tomorrow or tonight, <laughs> the jupe team or whatever, the Uber jupe. Right. Like, you know, I think if we had negotiated leases with all of these parking garages, rooftops, yeah. backyards, right. Parking spaces in 10 years, we're going to need a hell of a lot less parking, right? What are we going to do with all of that extra real estate, right? Right. The idea would then be autonomously, we should be able to deliver a living space for you that when you walk in, all of your settings click in like you were walking into your Tesla, right? Your Spotify clicks in, your temperature and lighting settings, all of that should follow you. You should never have to turn any of that shit on again. That's crazy. That's a really cool, <laughs> that's really cool. I'm definitely uh, inspired by the vision. Uh, you mentioned the uh, sort of user study you had for your, your San Francisco jupe. I'm curious about um, what other comments you've, you've, you've heard from like actual people that have rented out the plates. Are, are they kind of thinking of it as like a alternative Airbnb, like, sort of a, they're they're on vacation or uh, what what kind of feedback have you gotten? Yeah. I mean, almost all of our feedback is from the sort of glamping space, right? From people going into deep nature and staying in these things that we have heard most consistently is people say they get the best night of sleep of their life. Gary said that 
I've heard that from a lot of really high strung tech folks <laughs> in the Bay Area. People love the design. They always say they're much more cavernous and larger than they expect. Um, they love the fact that they're off grid. And so you've gotten a, a, a warm electric blanket or you know a fan there that you wouldn't normally expect. They love the fact that they set up and leave, leave no trace. Things that we're building out in the next versions that folks would like to see is the bathroom, right? We've just come out with a portal, but an attached bathroom, a hard insulated top, right? With either that's insulated well enough to run it off grid or attaching to shore power to a larger sort of, uh, you know, either battery bank or to the actual grid. Those are some of the, I guess, main kind of things we've heard. Yeah, from users. I think in the early days of uh, Airbnb, they, they talked about a, uh, a use case they would look at is when big conferences would come into cities, they would try to like kind of flood the space with available spots. And um, I think there were some like rallies for Obama and they were they were trying to like sort of serve that market. Uh, is that part of your distribution channel strategy to um, to look at when there might be big surges of new people? Yeah, spot, absolutely. Like, like, like Burning I mean, Man, say. Yeah, absolutely. Coachella. Absolutely. The, um, the, the dream for hospitality, right, is a, a, a true dynamic supply because demand, as you're saying, right, is so lumpy and so dynamic, but you can't go add 100, you know, you can't go add 50,000 Airbnbs overnight in Austin for South by Southwest and then make them go away. So, it's not this current version of the product, but a future version of the product that pops up and takes down in five minutes with one person, that's going to be very helpful, not only for things like Bernie Man or Coachella or Formula One or South By, right? Um, but also for disaster relief, right? When we uh, see these wildfires or, you know, Hurricane Ian, or the 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 you know the further quickening like of this stuff due to climate change, that's you, when that'll really come into play. You, you mentioned that skateboard strategy, and I started thinking about like if you might want to run some experiments. I know you got this like high end expensive hardware and everything, but but like literally just like using tents and to see if you could like have sort of like a tent influx for you know South by Southwest. I, I heard about. Um, some someone uh, from Draper University uh, finished the program, and she went to Austin for South by Southwest, and, and people were renting out tents in their backyard for hundred dollars a night. Um, oh yeah, no, so. it, I mean uh, that the those those high those events like South by right, um, and you think about every college football game in small college towns, right, like. The you know sometimes the, the the populations will swell like two three x in these small towns and there's just nowhere to put folks so you know I think our longer mission at Jupe and building all of this out is to really try to make a dent in the universe uh, of 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 these larger housing problems right 1.6 billion people do not have adequate shelter on the planet. Right. There's 100 million displaced from their homes every year by climate, political, um, natural disaster type uh, homelessness type things. So, uh, yeah, I'm hoping hoping we can we can get there. Awesome. Well, we don't want to take too much more time. You are the CEO of Jupe. <laughs> you got other things, more important things. Hey, but the world's so easy now. Fundraising's easy. <laughs> Running a startup's easy. You know, I I just like to jump from podcast to podcast. <laughs> I'm sure it'll all work itself out. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I guess, Greg, do you have any last question? Final? Well, I'm, I'm just grateful for your time and I uh, I, I support your mission. So th thank you for sharing your story. With yeah, us, thank Jeff. you guys for having me on. And Daniel, you know, would love to engage more with the Orange Dow folks. I am obviously a member, but have not been super active in the community. I mean, one of the things we're looking to do is to start to launch parts of the Jupe community. So we're looking for folks and groups and already formed communities say, hey, we wouldn't mind having like a place for all the Orange Dow folks to go 
on this small piece of land. Let's put 20 jupes and some bathrooms there, throw it on our booking platform and allow only Orange Dow members to go. Yep. Like, I think there are all kinds of smaller communal things like that that we can do with Jupe now. That sounds amazing. Even the Y Combinator community. Like, that would be cool if there was like a, a subset of YC uh, Jupe, Jupes for like founders to go with their own teams. That'd be no, really- that'd be so cool. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. But thank you so much, Jeff. This was amazing. We're going to, so what we'll do next steps, I guess we will uh, edit it. And, you know, we'll post it and send you, send you a copy. Feel free to use it, you know, take any piece of it for marketing, whatnot. Awesome. But this was amazing. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I feel like you're just doing something really noble for the world. So it was, I felt like your story needs to get out there more for, for well, people thanks. to we're hear We're trying, it. man. We're, we're going to make it go at it. All of us. All right. Well, I, for with that, I guess we'll let you go, Jeff. And then we will, uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.